Good day, learners and listeners. This is our first program in our Grade 8 series on agricultural science. Today, we'll be discussing farming systems in Namibia. Please get yourself a pen and a notebook ready, as I'm going to be asking you questions at the end of this program. My name is Jerry Joe, and today we have Tulela and Dafa in the studio. At the end of this program, you should be able to discuss the significance of subsistence farming in Namibia and how it can be improved to generate more income. Describe commercial farming, subsistence farming, and homestead farming using examples of each and tabulate the advantages and disadvantages of each system. Dafa, could you please tell the listeners where you come from? Of course. I come from a farm near the town of Rotfontein. It's a big farm where my father grows maize that he sells to Namib mills. Wow, that sounds very interesting, Dafa. We're going to ask you a lot of questions later. Now, Tulela, where do you come from? I come from a Dombe village in the Hangwene region. My father grows mahangu and beans, which he stores for us to eat during the year. Wow. It must be very good to grow your own food, Tulela. We'll definitely come back later to hear this story. I live in Tsumep, in town. We do not have fields where we can grow mahangu or maize, but we do grow vegetables around our house. Listeners, you have now heard about three different types of farming. We'll now have a closer look at each of them. Take notes so that you will be able to answer some questions later. We will start with Ndafa. She had a very interesting story. Dafa, tell us more about the farm that you come from. Well, farming on our maize farm takes place on a large scale and extensive areas of land are used. Once the maize is harvested, it's sold to Namib mills from where it's later sold to factories for processing. If there is enough maize, it can also be exported. The exporting of agricultural products allows farmers to earn foreign currencies. My father owns a lot of expensive machinery such as tractors, plows, planters and harvesting machines. He also employs about 12 workers on the farm permanently. There are a lot of buildings on the farm, some to store the seeds and fertilizers and others to keep the machinery in. The farm workers have their own houses. Very interesting, Dava. And what kind of farming is this? Oh, This type of farming is called commercial farming, where farming takes place on a larger scale in order to make a profit. What's produced on the farm is sold. Hmm, Dafa, we should definitely like to hear more about this fascinating commercial farming later. Let us go to Tulela now. Tulela, tell us about your farm from Ondombe village in the Hoangwena region. Wow, what Dafa talks about sounds very impressive but I'm sure she'll be impressed with what we do on our farm as well. We farm on a much smaller scale and produce food for family use or consumption. We do not have large machines on our farm. The workers on our farm are all family, so we have a lot of money on paying salaries. We normally grow crops such as mahangu, groundnuts, sorghum and beans after harvesting. Our mahangu and beans are stored in big baskets or cellars known as Okanda Eshisha for use throughout the year. If we have extra food, we will sell it. The extra food is called a surplus. We also keep a few animals for their milk and to sell when we need money for school fees or weddings or funerals. Cultivating the land takes place with simple hand tools and harvesting is also done by hand. We basically produce food to sustain the family and most of the time, survival of the family depends on the food we grow. That's amazing, Tulela. Do you know what type of farming this is called? Absolutely, sir. It's called subsistence farming. About 70% of the people living in the rural areas of Namibia are subsistence farmers. Subsistence farming mostly takes place in the rural areas, also called communal areas. Subsistence farming is significant because it enables rural households to grow their own food and not to depend entirely on the government to give them food. Hmm, this is a big part of the population. I never realized that. Let me tell you about the types of farming we practice in our town. We practice homestead farming, which means farming around our home. We have a small area of land around our house on which we can grow 
different types of vegetables and fruits, and we also keep a few chickens. This is not a source of income, because my mother and father both receive salaries, but these vegetables and fruits supplement their income. It saves a lot of money if we do not have to buy all our food because we can grow some of our own. It is also healthy to eat a lot of vegetables and fruit. Learners and listeners, you have now heard about commercial farming, subsistence farming, and homestead farming. We will still continue to ask Dafa and Tulela some questions, so remember to keep your notes updated. Let's go back to Dafa on commercial farming. Dafa. Yes, sir. What does your father do to increase the production of maize on your commercial farm? Pests and diseases and drought are always a problem on any farm. My father makes use of chemicals such as fertilizers and pesticides to help plants grow better and we practice irrigation to prevent the effects of drought. He also practices rotational grazing to prevent overgrazing the land and so that there is always enough grazing for the animals. As you can hear from what Dafa is telling you, her father and his workers need a lot of knowledge and skills to make as much profit as possible. He also need a lot of capital to make all this happen. Tulela? Yes, sir. You said about 70% of the Namibian nation depends on subsistence farming. That's right, sir. What do you think is necessary to improve subsistence farming to generate more food and more income? Well, I can tell you what my father has been doing for a number of years now. He plants better quality seeds, such as seeds that are better adapted to drought. He also uses organic fertilizers such as manure and compost to provide the plants with food. My father also tries by all means to have better tools and equipment to use when farming to make our work easier. I've also noticed that my father does crop rotation, where he never plants the same crop on the same field as the previous year. Crop rotation prevents depletion of nutrients from the soil. He does intercropping which means he plants beans or pumpkins or other crops between the rows of Mahangu. In this way, he makes use of all the available land. We also keep fewer animals so that the ones that we have have more food to eat and are in a better condition. But Tulela, does your father also make use of pesticides to kill pests that want to eat the Mahangu? Well, pests are always a problem and therefore my father usually plants strong smelling plants, either around the field or at certain places in the field. These are very good to keep pests away because they do not like the smell, they do not come near the field. Wow, that's nice. Well, Dafa and Tulela, you have really told me interesting stories today, haven't you ladies? We have. We have. For homestead farming, we also make use of strong smelling plants to drive pests away in our garden. We make use of compost in the kitchen waste, to, which we add to the soil to increase the nutrients from the plants. Vegetables and fruits grow well in containers, so no one has any excuse to not grow their own food. Isn't that right? It is. Absolutely, sir. Listening to you too, I am sure that you will one day make good farmers. Thank you for telling us about your farms today. You're most You're welcome. welcome now, let's look at what we've learned today. Commercial farming is practiced on a very large area and farming is done to make as much money as possible. Inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, rotational grazing and irrigation are used and machinery and skilled workers to do the work. The farmer needs a lot of capital to be able to produce high yield. Subsistence farming is farming done on a small scale to produce food for the family's sustenance. Family members do work and organic material is used as fertilizers and to keep pests away. Farming is done on hand without any tools. The use of quality seeds, fertilizers and better tools and equipment and crop rotation can increase production in subsistence farming. Subsistence farming is important because it allows rural households to have food and not depend on handouts from the government. 
Homestead farming is practiced around the house in towns or villages. Vegetables and fruits are planted to supplement the farmer's income or salary. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about farming systems in Namibia. You can now answer the following questions in your notebook. Question 1. Tabulate the advantages and disadvantages of the three farming systems. I hope you have enjoyed the lesson and you have taken notes to study. Take care. Until next time. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Good day, learners and listeners. This is our second program in our Grade 8 series on Agricultural Science. Today we are going to discuss plant processes. Please get your pen and a notebook ready. My name is Nodi Yambo and I have Angola and Hileni with me in the studio. At the end of this program, you should be able to describe the following processes and explain their importance. Photosynthesis respiration, transpiration, osmosis, translocation. Good morning, Angola and Hileni. Good morning, good morning sir. sir. How are you today? We're, We're good. Fine. I hope you had something to eat before you came to the studio. We do not want the microphone to pick up the sound of rambling stomachs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. We did eat. And let me ask you a question. What did you eat this morning? I had bread with butter, avocado and a cup of tea. But why are you so interested in what I ate? I just wanted to find out if you know how the food that you eat is produced. Yes, I bought it at the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not what he meant. And I knew he was going to say that. Is that not where all the food comes from? No, not at all. All food is produced by plants. The supermarkets only sell the food. Really? Tell me more about that. Well, sir, plants make their own food through the process photosynthesis. Plants use this food to grow and reproduce. The excess food is then stored in different parts of the plants, such as leaves, roots, stems, fruits, and seeds. People and animals then eat these parts of the plant. Hmm. Please say that again but very slowly this time. Sir, plants make their own food through the process photosynthesis. Plants use the food they produce to grow and reproduce. The excess food is then stored in different parts of the plants, such as leaves, roots, stems, fruits, and seeds. These parts of the plants are what people and animals eat. Please tell me more about how the process of photosynthesis takes place. Allow me to explain. Plants need light energy from the sun, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which enters through the leaf, through the stomata, and water, which is taken up by the roots from the soil and reaches the leaves through the xylem. Carbon dioxide enters the leaves by diffusion, while water enters the palisite cells of the leaves by osmosis. And also during the process of photosynthesis, carbohydrates such as glucose are formed. A very important gas, which is oxygen, is also produced during photosynthesis and is released into the atmosphere. Well, without photosynthesis, life on Earth would not be possible. Plants make food for themselves and for the people and animals. 
Plants also reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants are the only living organisms that can make their own food. Listeners, let us make a drawing in our notebooks to help us understand this better. Do it with me. Draw a plant with roots, a stem, branches, and leaves. Now draw the sun. Write the words light, carbon dioxide, and water somewhere on the page. Are you still with me? Now make arrows from those three words towards the part of the plant that needs it. Remember, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere enters through the leaves and water enters through the roots from the soil. Light comes from the sun. Now indicate on the picture that oxygen is released. You should draw an arrow pointing away from the leaves into the atmosphere and there you see the whole process in front of you. Easy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now animals and people have oxygen to breathe in. Yes, but plants also need oxygen. Now you are going to tell me that plants also breathe? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Just like animals and humans, plants need oxygen and glucose for the process of cell respiration, which takes place in all living cells. For respiration to take place, the carbohydrates, which is called glucose, needs to be broken down in the presence of oxygen so that the energy that is stored in the glucose can be released to enable the plant to grow, reproduce, and repay itself. Respiration is defined as the process where energy is released from glucose. And the waste products of respiration are carbon dioxide and water, which are lost through the leaves of the plant. It is not only plants that need energy. All living organisms need oxygen for cell respiration to break down glucose to release energy for them to be able to do work, play and grow. So what you are telling me is that the food that I ate this morning will be broken down in my body to release energy to work. Whoa! Now I have learned something new. I know you have to eat to have energy, but I never knew where the energy comes from. Thank you guys. Remember that photosynthesis can only take place during the day because it needs the light energy from the sun unless you provide the plant with artificial light at night. But respiration can take place during the day and during the night. You mentioned something else that interests me. You said that plants need the carbohydrates that are made during photosynthesis to grow. But how does it reach all parts of the plant? And when given fertilizers, it enters the plant through the roots but how can it help the other parts of the plant to grow? That was a very, very good observation, sir. You raised valid questions. And yes, you're right. The food needs to be transported through the plant to reach all parts of the plant. Minerals and water absorbed from the soil are transported from the roots to the upper parts of the plant by xylem vessels. The food made during photosynthesis is transported from the leaves to all parts of the plant. This transport of food through the plant is called translocation. The food is translocated through the specialized tube cells, which are called the phloem tubes. Well, I never knew when I entered the studio this morning that I will learn so much today. I have another question about my plant at home, but I do not know if I can ask it here. Maybe it does not fit into your program. No, sir. Please ask. I just hope we can help you. I have quite a few plants on the patio at my flat. The thing is, I would water the plants on a Monday morning and by the end of the week, the leaves are hanging like they want to die. What does that mean? Your plants have wilted, sir. But why? What happened? I wanted to throw away some of them, but then... When I watered them, they were fine. Well, sir, wilting takes place because of transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water from the plant through the leaves. Water can also be lost through the plant stem. 
The leaf surfaces contain a lot of small openings called stomata, to which water is lost. Transpiration enables the flow of minerals and water from the roots to the rest of the plant through the transpiration stream. So what you are telling me is that if that transpiration stream breaks because the water is lost faster than the roots can take it up, my plant will wilt? Definitely. But tell you what, go do the following at home so that you can see just how much water a plant can lose. Find a leafy tree nearby. Look for a branch that receives sunlight for most of the day. Tie a clear plastic bag around the branch and close it with a rubber band. Make sure you include as many leaves as possible in the bag. Observe for a few days. You'll see water in the plastic bag. This comes from the leaves that lost water through the process of transpiration. This will help you understand the importance of watering your plants regularly. That sounds great! And I will definitely do it. What do you say, listeners? Will you do it with me? Only one more question. How do the water and nutrients get into the plant roots to be transported through the plant? Well, that takes place through a process called osmosis. This is where water with dissolved nutrients move from the soil, where there is a high concentration of water, into the plant roots, where there is a low concentration of water, through a partially permeable membrane. What are you talking about? What is a partially permeable membrane? <laughs> a partially permeable membrane is a membrane that will only allow certain substances to pass through it and it will prevent others to pass through. So only water with some dissolved nutrients enters the plant during the process of osmosis? Exactly. Wow! Listeners, today's lesson was a mouthful. Thank you, Angula and Hileni. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. Up to the sky, up to the sky, jump to the sky, up to the sky, up to the sky, up to the sky. Let's now look at what we have learned from today's lesson. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants make their own food using sunlight as source of energy. The plant also uses carbon dioxide and water during photosynthesis. Oxygen and glucose are released. Respiration is the process whereby glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water in the presence of oxygen. Energy is released during this process. Transpiration is the loss of water from plants from the leaves through the stomata. Osmosis is the movement of water from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration through a partially permeable membrane. Translocation is the movement of food throughout the plant. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about plant processes and their importance. Here are your questions for the day. Describe the process of photosynthesis. State which process releases energy. Explain the process of translocation. I hope you have enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. Take care. Until next time, goodbye. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Good day, learners and listeners. 
This is our third program in our series on Grade 8 Agricultural Science. Today we are going to discuss the management of fruit trees. Please get your pen and a notebook ready. My name is Nodi Yambo and I will be in the studio today with Himi and Bashin. At the end of this program, you should be able to discuss the importance of safekeeping of seeds and seedlings, explain the importance of record keeping when planting trees, apply fertilizer and water fruit trees, know the correct way of pruning trees, describe pests, diseases and weed control, and specify the correct time and methods of harvesting and marketing fruits. Hello again to you too, and welcome to the program. Your teacher told me an interesting story about the two of you. She said that you have started a fruit tree growing project with unemployed people in Okahanja. Please tell me more about this. It really sounds interesting. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. We first went to the municipality and explained our project to them. They then gave us a piece of land that was too small for any other kind of business or even for a building or a house. After that, we had a meeting with a few businessmen in town and we had to say that the response was phenomenal. Our little plot was fenced we built a little shed and bought the necessary tools. We had water installed and fertilizers delivered, and we are ready to go. But why are you doing this? You are still young and you are putting so much effort into this project while other young people are just roaming the streets. Why? Well, we had an agriculture teacher who taught us that you can always grow your own food and make an income even on the smallest piece of land, and this is what we want to teach others too. These people will work on the plot, but will also be taught the necessary skills to grow their own fruit trees around their own houses, no matter the size of the land. Well, you definitely have me interested. I will sit here quietly and make my own notes. Please continue. As our trees were already planted and are growing strongly, we are going to talk about some of the other to-do things concerning fruit trees today. I'll start by talking about the safekeeping of seeds and seedlings. One of the reasons why we started this project is to show people that they can all plant fruit trees as they already have the seeds. Yes, they do. Whenever you eat fruit, you are left with the seeds, but you usually just throw it away. Next time, when you throw away that mango seed, a papaya seed, or spit out the orange seeds, think of it as a tree you are throwing away. When you collect the seeds to grow trees, it's important that you only collect seeds that are not damaged. The seeds should be properly dried and kept in airtight containers in a cool area. Make sure that you mark the container properly with the name of the seeds date collected and place collected. Once the seeds are planted and start growing, the seedlings should be kept in a protected area until they are strong enough to be planted out. What do you mean by protected area? Who is protecting them? <laughs> <laughs> no! Protected from the wind and high and low temperatures. They can be kept in a nursery or under a shade tree. You talked about writing information on the container in which you keep the seeds. What is that all about? Allow me to answer that, sir. That information is part of your record keeping. The name of the seed is important for obvious reasons. You do not want to plant a mango tree and expect to harvest bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Once your seeds are planted, you have to make sure that all the necessary information is also available on the bag or the container in which the seedlings grow. You need to write the name and the number of your tree. If you have more than one of the same kind and the date planted on the container, this information must then be transferred onto your diary or the computer. Can you imagine wanting to sell your tree one day 
and the customer asks how old the tree is and where the seeds were collected and all you can say is um ah hmm can you tell me a little more about the information needed for the diary you also need to record information about the pest and the disease that attacked the tree and indicate the date it happened also indicate what treatment you gave against the pest or the disease and whether it was successful or not you also need to record what type of fertilizer you used how much was added and on which date it is also very important to indicate when the first fruit appeared you should also record how much money you spend on the tree and how much income you get from selling your fruit basically everything about the tree should be recorded that way you will know if you should plant more of the same tree or try another one thank you himi bashin himi talked about using fertilizers do fruit trees also need fertilizers i thought fertilizers are only for things such as maize and mahango oh no you need to make sure that your fruit tree has enough of the right nutrients to make it grow properly and produce enough tasty fruit That's why the tree needs enough nitrogen for leaf growth, enough phosphorus for root growth, and enough potassium for the growth of good quality, tasty fruit. When you plant your tree, you should put organic fertilizers such as superphosphate and a lot of organic material in the hole before planting. The phosphate will then be available when the roots start growing. and the organic material will provide nutrients over a long period of time during the growing season of the fruit tree an inorganic fertilizer called npk fertilizer can be used according to the needs of the fruit tree the npk fertilizer provides plants with nitrogen phosphorus and potassium respectively and once again always remember to record the name of the fertilizer and the amount used in your diary and also to water the tree thoroughly when adding in organic fertilizer to enable the nutrients to dissolve in water so that the tree roots can take it up and here i thought i can just plant the tree and come back when it starts giving me fruits what else is there that has to be done it's very important to prune your trees bashin what on earth does pruning mean <laughs> Well, pruning means to cut away branches in order to shape the tree. It's also done to cut out dead and deceased wood. If the branches are growing too close together, the leaves and fruit will not get enough sunlight, which is very important for the growth of the tree and the fruit. And you also don't want branches to grow too long and then break because of the many fruit they are bearing. So what you are telling me is that I can manipulate the growth of a tree exactly and this is very important to ensure your fruit tree yields maximum harvest just be sure your tree needs pruning because not all fruit trees do what do i use to prune a tree with you can use pruning shears also called secateurs for thinner branches and a pruning saw for thicker branches you do not need a lot of tools to maintain fruit trees Is it not time now that you start telling me how to harvest the fruit? I can already see and taste the big juicy oranges. No, unfortunately, there are also pests and diseases that that can attack the fruit trees and that must be taken care of. A pest is an organism that feed on and causes damage to the plant. For example, insects and flies. Diseases are conditions that prevent the plant to produce their own maximum and they are caused by microorganisms called fungi, bacteria and viruses. I'm sure, Mr. Hans, that you would not want to cut open a nice juicy orange that was attacked by a fruit fly. Oh no, Himi. That doesn't sound good. What can I do to prevent them or to get rid of them? Well, Mr. Hans, Fruit flies can easily be deterred by hanging a plastic bag with sugar water near your trees. The fruit flies are just after the sugary taste and will leave your trees alone. Fruit flies are piercing and sucking pests, which means their mouth parts are developed to 
enable them to pierce a small hole into the fruit and suck out the sap of the fruit, leaving a rotten patch inside the fruit. Aphids are also part of the group of pests. Ah, how else can I get rid of them? Well, Mr. Hans, you can also use pesticides such as malation. But as this is a chemical, it is not very environmental friendly. You should rather plant some marigolds, which are a flowery plant close to your fruit trees. Pests do not like the smell of marigolds and will stay away. Besides, the marigolds will look pretty in your garden. Do fruit trees also get diseases? Unfortunately, yes. Tristeza is a disease in citrus that is transmitted by a black fly. So, in this case, the black fly should be controlled and it can be done in the same way as the fruit fly. What about weeds? Are they also a problem for fruit trees? Yes, sir. Weeds are always a problem in any garden, also for fruit trees. They take away valuable nutrients and water that your fruit tree needs, especially if the tree is still young. You sometimes see that people like to leave weeds around their fruit trees, but the problem is that these weeds can harbor pests and disease-causing organisms. It's better to get rid of these weeds before they become too big. They can be taken out by hand or by using a hoe or spade. Herbicides can be used, but because it's a chemical, it might damage the environment. I am sure we have done everything that is needed now. Can I harvest my fruit by now? Some fruit trees will bear fruits faster than others, and it is important that you find out how soon your trees will bear fruit, and when the fruit is ready for harvesting. Most fruit is picked by hand when they have the right color and is fully ripe. It should therefore be handled carefully as the fruit can bruise very easily and is not suitable for the market. Most fruit cannot be stored for a long time and should be sold soon after harvesting to prevent them from rotting. Some fruit such as papaya can be picked just before it is fully ripe but you should then sell them immediately as they ripen very fast. And you can sell your fruit to your neighbors and friends or sell it at the open market. Some farmers who have large orchards can sell their fruit to local supermarkets. So Mr. Hans, are you still going to grow your own fruit trees or do you think it's too much work? It sounds like a lot of work, but the reward sounds very tasty. I will definitely give it a try. Thank you very much for the information. You're welcome. You're welcome, sir. Let's now look at what we have learned from today's lesson. Fruit trees can be grown from seeds or seedlings that should be stored under the right conditions so as not to be damaged by environmental factors such as temperature, wind, sunlight, and animals. Record keeping of all activities involved in the planting of fruit trees are important as it enables farmers to use previous information in the future and also to be able to evaluate the success of their farming activities. The right fertilizers should be applied at the right time. Pruning is important to shape the tree, allow fruit trees to receive the maximum amount of sunlight and allow fruit trees to grow well. Weeds, pests, and diseases should be controlled to ensure a good harvest. Fruit should be sold as soon as possible after harvesting to prevent them from spoiling or rotting. Fruits can be harvested by using secateurs or knives. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about the management of fruit trees. Here are your questions for the day. Describe four factors that need to be recorded when working with fruit trees. Discuss pruning as a way to manipulate trees to bear more fruit. Name two pests that attack fruit trees and explain how to control them. I hope you have enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. Take care. Until next time. Goodbye. 
This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Good day, learners and listeners. This is our fourth program in our series on Grade 8 Agricultural Science. Today we are discussing animal nutrition. Please get your pen and a notebook ready as I am going to give you some questions at the end of the lesson. My name is Nodi Yambo and I have Ivan and Limey with me in the studio today. At the end of this program, you should be able to Identify the different types of animal feed and provide examples of each. Describe ways of feeding farm animals. Explain what is meant by a balanced ration or diet. Name the sources and explain the functions of each of the following nutrients in the animal's body. Proteins, carbohydrates, fats, minerals, and vitamins. State the functions of water in an animal's body. Explain what is meant by deficiency, diseases in animal production. And list some deficiency, diseases found in animals. Good morning to my co-presenters, Ivan and Limey. Good, Good morning, morning, Mr. Hans. I heard that the two of you are aspiring farmers. What are you going to share with the Namibian nation today? So we would like to talk about something that's very important to almost every Namibian and certainly important to every Namibian farmer, and that's animal nutrition. Oh, yes. I can just imagine how the farmers who are listening are now sitting on the edge of their seats to hear what you are going to tell them. Please go right ahead. I will also make notes to go and tell my father on the farm. I would like to start talking about the different types of animal feed. The main type of animal feed are natural vegetation or pasture, cultivated pasture and supplementary feed. Laimi, can you explain for us each one of the feeds? Of course. Okay. Natural pasture is an area with plants and grasses that grow naturally in the area which animals can graze on. They do not require planting or watering. Most farm animals in Namibia feed on natural pasture. And then, cultivated pasture refers to plants and grasses that are planted for animals to eat. This type of pasture usually has a high nutritional value. The farmer plants the grasses and legumes together in cultivated pasture to ensure that the animals get enough nitrogen from the legumes to grow well. Legumes are classified as concentrates. Concentrates are foods that have a high percentage of digestible nutrients and are high in protein content. And supplementary feed is the extra food that is given to animals especially when the natural vegetation is dry or when animals have specific needs, such as lactating or being fattened for the market. This type of feed is given to animals in limited amounts. What type of supplementary feed can I give my animals, Limey? Well, supplementary feed is, like I said, extra food. This can be hay, which is grass that was cut and left in the sun to dry. Most farmers in Namibia make hay during the rainy season, 
when there is more than enough grass. Silage is another form of supplementary feed. Silage is green feed that is preserved and stored in succulent form in such a way that the nutritive value is retained. Silage is rich in vitamins. It's easy to digest and helps the digestion of other feeds in the ration. Silage can be stored for a long time without losing its nutritive value and it's palatable. We do not often make use of silage in Namibia. These types of feed, namely hay and silage, are classified as roughage. Roughage are foods with a high carbohydrate content, but a low percentage of digestible nutrients. I'm sure if you have been on an animal farm before, you could have seen mineral leaks. Farmers place mineral leaks near water sources. Animals lick the stone or block and get the necessary minerals. We know it on the farm as the soot lek or soot clip. This is a source of minerals for animals, especially during drought. Now I understand. I have never asked my father about this before. I just thought it was an ordinary stone near every water point. Can you buy this? Yes. You buy the mineral leaks at agricultural corporations. Can I say agra? All these things you have mentioned now make me remember one of my grade 4 lessons about eating a balanced diet. Our teacher talked about vitamins and minerals and eating your fruit and vegetables. <laughs> Fortunately, it is not like that with animals. Eish. Whoa, whoa, Mr. Hans. Wait a minute. It's exactly the same for animals. What are you talking about, Ivan? Is this not a lesson about animal food? Yes, it certainly is. But animals also need to eat a balanced diet to keep them healthy and to make sure they grow and develop normally. Ivan, what is a balanced diet? A balanced diet is a mixture of food containing all the essential nutrients the animal needs in the right amount. It is important that animals should eat a balanced diet in order to keep them healthy and to ensure normal growth and development. Ivan, what are these essential nutrients that you are talking about? Why do the animals need them and where will you find them? There are five essential nutrients. I will talk about each one separately. The first one is carbohydrates. Fodder, which is prepared food such as dried hay, consists mainly of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are needed for the production of energy in the body of the animal. Sources of carbohydrates are cereal crop such as wheat, maize, mahangu, as well as root crops such as potatoes and sweet potatoes. Natural grass provides a large amount of carbohydrates. Then we come to fats. Fats are mainly found in seeds of plants. Fats are rich in energy but cannot be broken down in the body of the animal as easily as carbohydrates. Fats are therefore stored in the body around vital organs such as the stomach and the kidneys as reserved energy. Another important one is protein. Proteins can be described as the bodybuilders. Proteins are needed by animals for growth and reproduction. Leguminous plants such as beans and larusins are rich in proteins. Okay, Ivan, what about minerals and vitamins? Minerals and vitamins are essential for the health of the animal. Calcium and phosphorus are important for the formation of strong bones and teeth. Animals get their minerals from plant material, water and mineral licks. The percentage of minerals in a plant is, however, very low, especially when it is dry and feed supplements containing minerals are therefore very important. When animals do not have enough minerals, they will suffer from deficiency diseases such as anemia, which is caused by the lack of iron. Farmers provide animals with minerals by placing a mineral lick near the water sources as you have already explained, Limey. Vitamins are important for the normal growth of development. 
they are needed in small amounts only. Animals get vitamins from green plants, grain and oil seeds. Vitamin A is important for the mucous membrane and good eyesight. Fresh green leaves contain vitamin A. Vitamin D is necessary for formation of bone system and for keeping bones and the teeth healthy. Vitamin D is produced in the body when exposed to sunlight. You can therefore see that animals in Namibia will rarely suffer from the lack of vitamin D. Vitamin E improves fertility and is needed for the muscles of the body. It is found in leaves, vegetables and cereals. Vitamin K is necessary for blood to clot and is found in green leafy vegetables. And here I thought I can become a farmer so that I can sit under a tree and look at my animals the whole day. Now it sounds like a lot of work to make sure that my animals get the right nutrients in the right amount. But I have noticed that you said nothing about water. And I know animals need water, but I do not really know what for. Well, water is very important to animals. Water makes up the biggest part of an animal's body. It's needed for the digestion of food and absorption of nutrients. It serves as a solvent, dissolving nutrients in the blood and waste in the urine. It serves as a medium for chemical reactions. It gives shape to the cells of the body. It helps to cool the body when the water evaporates from the body. It forms a large part of the blood and it's needed for excretion of waste products from the body. But what will happen if a farmer does not take care of these things that you have talked about? Oh, that would be a very, very big problem. And the fact is that the farmer will only see it once the animal shows a deficiency disease. What is a deficiency disease? A deficiency disease is a disease caused by a lack of certain nutrient in the diet of an animal. So if the animal shows certain signs, the farmer will be able to know which nutrients is lacking? Definitely. I'll give you a few examples of deficiency diseases. Anemia is caused by a lack of iron in the diet of an animal, especially in animals that do not graze on natural pasture. Rickets is caused by a lack of calcium and phosphorus, as well as a lack of vitamin D. This disease shows abnormalities of bones and teeth. Guaita shows a swollen thyroid gland in the neck due to lack of iodine. Milk fever is caused by a lack of calcium in the cow's blood after calving. And infertility is not a disease, but it's caused by a lack of vitamin E. Oh, that's not really so many. Oh, that is not so many. It should not be a problem. Well, Mr. Hans, I have a surprise for you. There are a lot more. Farmers should consult other resources and talk to veterinary services to familiarize themselves with the most common deficiency diseases in their area. Wow, listeners! Today's lesson was really useful for farmers. Thank you, you too. Let's now look at what we have learned from today's lesson. Natural pasture refers to grasses and plants that grow naturally in an area. Cultivated pasture consists of plants and grasses that are planted and have a high nutritional value. Supplementary feed is the extra food given to animals. Animals can be fed with natural pasture, mineral leaks which farmers give to ensure that animals get all the minerals they need. Hay, which is grass that is cut and dried in the sun. Silage, which is green feed that is preserved and stored in succulent form in such a way that the nutritive value is retained. Cultivated pastures, which are grasses planted by the farmer and usually irrigated. A balanced diet is a mixture of food containing all the essential nutrients the animals need in the right amount. The main feed components needed by animals are carbohydrates that are needed for the production of energy in the body of the animal, 
fats that are rich in energy, proteins that are needed by animals for growth and reproduction, minerals that are essential for the health of animals, vitamins that are important for normal growth and development. The functions of water in an animal's body are it is needed for digestion of food and absorption of nutrients. It serves as a solvent, dissolving nutrients in the blood and waste in the urine. It serves as a medium for chemical reactions. It gives shape to the cells of the body. It helps to cool the body when water evaporates from the body. It forms a large part of the blood. It is needed for excretion of waste products from the body. Deficiency diseases are caused by a lack of certain nutrients in the diet of an animal. Anemia is caused by a lack of iron in the diet. Rickets is caused by a lack of calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Gout is caused by a lack of iodine. Milk fever is caused by a lack of calcium and infertility is caused by a lack of vitamin E. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about animal nutrition. Let me give you the questions I have promised you in the beginning. You can answer these questions in your notebook. Number one, discuss the importance of water in the body of an animal. Number two, explain what is meant by a balanced diet. And number three, explain what a deficiency disease is and name any three deficiency diseases and how they can be prevented. I hope you have enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes to study. Take care. Until next time. Goodbye. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Good day, learners and listeners. This is our fifth program in our series on Grade 8 Agricultural Science. Today we are going to discuss the health of pigs. Please get your pen and a notebook ready. My name is Nodi Iambo, and with me in studio today, I have Lloyd and Hosea, and they will talk about the health of pigs. At the end of this program, you should be able to describe pig diseases according to their symptoms, describe how to prevent and control diseases and parasites affecting pigs, and discuss the role of veterinary services in animal health. Lloyd and Hosea, you two mentioned that you want to start a pig farm one day because there is always a market for pork. I am sure you are aware of the fact that one of the major challenges that farmers face is diseases. Now let us talk about pig diseases, their symptoms and how to prevent and control them. Thank you so much, Mr. Hans, for this opportunity to discuss the health of pigs with the listeners. Well, pigs also get sick. That's why we want to talk to others about the health of pigs so that they will be able to prevent and control the diseases. But how do you know when your pig is sick? It's not like a person who can tell you when he or she feels sick. That is true, Mr. Hans. But there are general symptoms that you can tell your pig is sick. If a pig doesn't want to eat, 
and he's just lying down, there's usually something wrong. Diarrhea, a high fever, and coughs can also be signs that the pig is sick. But how will you know which disease it has? Those signs that Hosea just described are just general signs to tell a farmer to look for other signs and symptoms. Each disease is caused by a different organism and each disease has its own specific symptoms. So a farmer also needs to be a veterinarian too? No, but it helps if the farmer knows the symptoms of diseases that are common in the area. This knowledge will also help you to know if it is necessary to talk to a veterinarian to find out if the disease is a problem in the area. Okay then, pretend that I am a pig farmer. Tell me about the symptoms of some of these diseases. I will write it down in my notebook. I'll start. And the first disease I want to talk about is swine fever. Do you know that swine is the German word for pig? <laughs> now you are teaching me on another language too? <laughs> Swine fever is caused by a virus. A virus is a microscopic parasite. The symptoms of swine fever are weakness, high temperature, therefore the word fever, fast breathing, blood in the dung, and discharge from the eyes. Pigs usually die when they catch this disease and it can easily spread from one pig to another, which means it's highly contagious. Once pigs are infected with this disease, they cannot be cured, but vaccinating the healthy ones can prevent pigs from getting the disease. Did you write all that down, Mr. Hans? Yes, Lloyde. My notes are up to date. Are there more diseases that you want to talk about? Let me let Hosea tell you about anthrax. I have heard about anthrax. Is that not a very dangerous disease? Yes, anthrax is not a disease to take lightly. It is caused by bacteria. Bacteria are one-celled or single-celled, microscopic living organisms. Anthrax is highly contagious. The problem is that animals die within 24 hours after contracting this disease. So sometimes farmers do not even notice that the pigs are sick. Some signs are difficulties in breathing and bleeding from openings of carcasses. A carcass is a dead body of an animal. If anthrax is suspected, a veterinarian should be called immediately. The carcass should not be cut open, but buried and burned, as the bacteria can live in the soil for a very long time. Pigs should be vaccinated against anthrax regularly. People can also get infected with anthrax, and that is why the meat of such an animal should never be eaten. This sounds crazy! Can you also tell us about internal parasites that affect pigs, Hosea, please? Are you referring to the parasites that live inside the body of the animal? Yes. There are two types of different internal parasites that affect pigs. The first one I want to talk about is roundworms that live inside the small intestine of the pig. The larvae move through the holes in the small intestine into the bloodstream to the liver, the heart and lungs. It is mostly younger pigs that are affected. Roundworms can cause anemia, poor growth and low production. Infected pigs can become weak and start to cough. Ah, shame. It is a terrible feeling for a young pig to go through. Is there anything a farmer can do about it? Yes, there is. Roundworms can be controlled by regular dosing. Dosing is pouring a liquid dose of medicine down the throat of an animal with a dosing gun. One can also add a powder to their food that will keep the control of this parasite. However, the best way to control the parasite, roundworm, is to make sure that the housing is clean and disinfected at least once a week as the eggs of these parasites can be ingested through the drippings of the pigs you can understand why clean conditions are of utmost importance that is true for any disease even in humans there's another little nasty one the tapeworm 
Humans get it when eating beef that's not properly cooked. The tapeworm segments are secreted with human feces and if pigs eat the feces, they get infected. The pigs do not show any outward signs that they have the parasite. But when they are slaughtered, small white nodules can be seen on the meat and under the tongue of the pig. This condition is called measles. Such meat should not be eaten. What's interesting though, is that you do not need to treat pigs against tapeworms. Instead, you treat the humans working with the pigs. Pigs should never have access to human feces. You see here, we are again talking about a clean environment. So, in this case, humans are the culprits? Certainly. But let me tell you about two external parasites that annoy pigs. The first one is a parasite that burrows under the skin of the pig and sucks its blood. Scabs then form on the skin of the pig, causing the pig to scratch itself continuously. This is called mange. Pigs also become weak. The farmer can buy medicine to mix with the food and again the living conditions and environment of the pigs should be kept clean. Then there are also lice that move over the pig's body and suck its blood. They also cause irritation and scratching and growth and production diseases. Pigs with external parasites are sprayed with medicine or dipped into a liquid containing the right medicine to kill or control these parasites. Wow! This is a mouthful! How do farmers do this? Where do they get all this knowledge if they haven't even studied to be veterinarians? That is where the veterinary services come in. And in Namibia, it is a well-developed system. Veterinarians have the knowledge to help the farmers all the way. They can identify diseases and parasites and suggest ways to control them. They will also make sure that all farmers in an area know where there is an outbreak of a contagious disease and they will help to control the spread of the disease. They give information to the farmers on how and when to vaccinate, doze and deworm their animals. The officers at the veterinary offices are the great source of advice on everything related to raising animals and taking care of them. You have really given the listeners a lot to think about today. Let's now look at what we have learned from this lesson. The symptoms of a sick animal are Pig doesn't want to eat. This is also referred to as a loss of appetite. Just laying down. Has diarrhea. Has a high fever and coughs. Swine fever is caused by a virus. The symptoms are Weakness, high temperature, from there the word fever, fast breathing, blood in the dung and discharge from the eyes, it's highly contagious, vaccinate to prevent pigs from getting the disease. Anthrax is caused by bacteria, it's highly contagious, animals die within 24 hours, some signs are difficulty in breathing and a bleeding carcass. The carcass should be buried and vaccinate against anthrax regularly. Never eat the meat. Internal parasites are roundworm and tapeworm. They cause poor growth and production to prevent them by keeping the environment clean. They can also be treated or controlled by dosing pigs with medicine using a dosing gun. External parasites cause poor growth and production. Parasite that causes men, which causes scabs on the skin as it sucks blood. Mix medicine with food to prevent men. Lice suck blood and irritate the skin. Dust pigs against lice. They can also be treated by dipping pigs into medicine or spraying them with the right medicine.
veterinary services, identify diseases and parasites, and adjust ways to control them, inform about outbreaks of contagious diseases, help to control the spread of diseases, give information and advice to farmers. Listeners and learners, this brings us to the end of today's lesson about the health of pigs. Here are the questions for the day. State one disease of pigs that is caused by a virus and one that is caused by a bacteria. Discuss anthrax as a disease of pigs. Describe the role that veterinary services play in the health of animals. I hope you have enjoyed the lesson and have taken notes today. Take care. Until next time. Goodbye. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning.